Welcome to the Nonprofit Digital Success Podcast. I'm your host, David, and today I have David Summerfleck on the show, another David. Uh, allow me to introduce him. David is a digital marketing specialist providing digital marketing solutions with over 20 years experience working for marketing agencies across North America and 10 years experience as a certified small business mentor. David has written for AOL Time Warner, spoken to packed audiences at Microsoft, taught workshops for WordPress, helped hundreds of business owners ignite growth using a combination of traditional marketing with digital marketing. He's author of The Road to Digital Marketing Profits, available from Amazon, Walmart, and other retailers. David, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Anytime. Anytime. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. Every day is a blessing. Absolutely. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's jump in and, and just hit the hit the ground running here. I'm ready. Awesome. So the first question that I have for you is what has your experience been with nonprofits for the most part? I, I've had pretty broad, expansive experience working for nonprofit organizations or NPOs. I worked for a nonprofit organization in marketing, of course. Uh, I also worked with nonprofits as an independent, you know, digital marketing consultant. I also worked with nonprofits through marketing agencies that I worked for. And I also consulted with or advised probably hundreds of nonprofits. I mean, I lost count after probably the fifth year. Uh, so I've had a lot of um, experience working with nonprofit organizations in different capacities. That's phenomenal. Um, could you talk about your experiences with how the nonprofits tend to manage their digital marketing? Uh, where to begin? I think in so many cases, I think a lot of nonprofits will tend to put digital marketing on the back burner. And when I say digital marketing, it's important to qualify that and say that on the top, we have marketing. Below that, we have digital marketing. And then below that, we have what is traditionally seen as online marketing. Why do I make these distinctions? Because I work with these tools. So when I refer to marketing i mean all of the above digital marketing refers to communicating with your ideal consumers or in the case of nonprofit organizations donors or client base using digital media so you're using online tools digital tools traditional marketing all together so in my experience the majority of the time when i talk to nonprofit organizations it's because of a problem they're having a pain needing to be resolved so you know in the majority of instances the nonprofit organization needs more donors they need increased public visibility they don't know where to begin so obviously before i can help them i have to first diagnose the the issues and then latch on to what are the most important issues how do i prioritize these issues before i can go about setting the course of action to be taken to resolve these problems and nine times out of ten that digital marketing is done by volunteers which means they're unpaid which means their motivation is going to be very slim. What motivation do you have if you're working for free, usually on a part-time basis? If we take it a step further, what is your level of competence or experience or professionalism going to be if you're working for free on a part-time basis? How long will that person be around? Well, we don't know. So that's usually where it begins. Then I can look at the company's SEO, their social media, their branding, their content marketing or lack thereof. Look at how these factors are being treated holistically or not and work from there. But 
in most cases when you have unpaid part-time temporary staff it it, it it makes it kind of problematic so yeah you know. it's, it's, it's hard for nonprofits to to operate without volunteers right you, you need you need some um and at the same time like you just said the motivation why would anybody want to to work for free or give it necessarily their full throttle i think it's extremely important to look at when you have unpaid staff usually working on a part-time basis you have to look at how you're going to delegate your resources so in that context do you really want to entrust the future of your business in this case an npo to unpaid part-time staff i wouldn't do it and i've never seen good outcomes from that uh, type of planning you could have part-time unpaid staff doing work for you that may not be as immediately relevant or directly tied into your public perception you know such as answering the answering phones but then again wouldn't you want that done by someone who takes it very seriously too so you really have to look at how you're going to utilize part-time unpaid staff to me i that's it's it's problematic what are they going to deliver to you at the level that you need not being paid and potentially inexperienced as well so that's where it starts and then we go downhill from there in most cases now you know obvious i don't want to say obviously but i'm sure you know this having a nonprofit organization doesn't mean you don't make profit but that seems to be the perception amongst many npos especially those who are new to the npo environment that you know we can't make money or we're very poor we're very broke we have nothing everything has to be free or super cheap and and so on and that poverty mentality translates into how they're perceived the lack of seo the lack of content re, content distribution through social media content repurposing and so on so i deal a lot with those issues when i talk to npos but before i can really diagnose issues and help them we first have to get through that number one barrier that is that poverty mentality where either i'm holding on to this and i'm not investing in growth or i don't believe in online marketing or digital marketing as a field or you um suggesting i guess that most of the nonprofits and charity and community-based organizations that you've worked with are typically running their digital marketing in the free or volunteer kind of realm the vast majority of ones that i've encountered that come to me for help specifically will usually have a free diy template builder such as wix or weebly or squarespace uh, google sites um, and blogger and many other ones and traditionally they'll come to me and and say you know why am i not ranking in google search results why are my donations not increasing and um it's usually you know for a combination of factors you know you don't it's often a case of you don't know what you don't know right. so if you're not familiar with seo which is how you outrank competitors in online search if you don't know what that is exactly specifically and how that works and you're not familiar with programming then you're not going to know how to fix your problem and in most cases people who are npo administrators or founders are not also going to be experts in seo and content marketing and internal linking and external linking and all that goes into seo so before you can really help an npo to expand into new markets and matriculate new donors we first have to break through the 
the resistance to growth or the misconceptions, or in some cases, the two are entwined. Um, I was actually, you know, when I worked for marketing agencies, I would do what I call the boots on the ground work, you know, where my job was to create a beautiful, branded, modern, responsive website for NPO clients with high ranking SEO. I would look at their local competition or their national competition or combination thereof. I'd look at their competitors. But when I worked as a freelancer or independent consultant in between those positions, I had to learn how to take the structure of the marketing agency and apply it to what I was doing as an individual. And so in that process, which took several years, I had to learn how to screen clients for fit, which is NPOs, obviously, as well, as well as onboarding them, where I had to train them in how digital marketing would work before I could necessarily help them. So there's a whole process in there that I'm happy to elaborate on if you want. But while I was researching this, I found this, uh, this I think she's a psychologist, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I don't know if you've heard of her. No. Okay, she did a lot of groundbreaking research in what are called the stages of denial. So, and this was meant primarily for someone who is going through the loss of a loved one. Now, if you lose someone you love, obviously that's a, it's incredibly stressful to, as an understatement. And it may be wrong to compare that to a business owner or NPO owner who is resistant to change for whatever reason or combination of reasons. But I found that the steps matched almost 100%. That whenever, I wrote a blog post about it that's pretty lengthy where I showed the infographic and how it tied in almost 100% with the research that she had done. And it, it really actually, it, it surprised me as well. So now when I talk to potential clients, whether they're NPOs or not, I can see very specifically at what phase are they stuck in with the final fifth stage being acceptance of the situation. Okay, I have to invest in order to grow. I can't take a kit car that I bought from Amazon onto the interstate. I can't purchase a DIY root canal from eBay and do my own root canal and expect it, you know, to have a beautiful smile, right? And yet people do these things every day with the future of their NPO. Every day they entrust the future of their nonprofit organization into the hands of an automated DIY template builder or someone they found on Craigslist. And then they wonder why things aren't going the way that they had hoped. Well, as you or, reap, so shall you on, sow. Yeah. And on, on the flip side, uh, we've worked with a number of clients uh, from Wild Digital um, where the the companies they've reached out to or the, or the freelancers have locked them out of their website or not given them the full access or you know prevented right. them from moving and that's, their their services from one to another and, and we just did a migration last week of 15 sites from one client because the vendor first off they were running on drupal which is like a whole other thing but their right. their vendor uh, refused to give them access to their content well i'd like to address that when we talk about first of all for anybody listening or watching who doesn't know what drupal is there are three primary content management systems in the world today, WordPress being number one, the most popular. Since it's the most popular, it attracts the most hobbyists, which is good and bad. Because it attracts more hobbyists, it's also more, has it has issues with it that you have to be informed on. I think Joomla or Drupal, depending on who you talk to, is number two and number three. Drupal is has a steeper learning curve but has improved website security. Depending on who you talk to, Joomla or Drupal could be number two or number three. They're all very, very good, reputable content management systems that are basically the motor of a 
functioning modern website that delivers high value features. As far as, you know, a freelancer or even a marketing agency locking someone out of their website, that's not a good thing to do. That's not professional conduct. I can understand why it would happen, but I don't do it. And the reason that it happens, I feel, is because there is a breakdown in the process of screening first and then onboarding the client. You have to make sure, does the client understand the value that you provide? Can they afford you? Do they want what you can do for them? Do they have someone who will help them? You know, are they capable of paying their bills online? Usually if a marketing agency or a freelance or independent consultant locks someone out of a website, it's usually because there's a miscommunication there. They haven't been paid, something like that. And so in my own case, and I learned this from agencies. So when I screen the client, first we focus in on what's the value, what's the problem, what's going on, are we a good fit for each other, these types of topics. In the onboarding, I train the client in how I work, how long a project should take, what steps are involved, what is SEO, what is the value of SEO, what about e-commerce. All of these things we, we go over before we can begin to work. Then I go over the contract with them so they understand. Here's how these things work. So there should never be any need to lock you out of a website. And so when you inherit uh, situations like that, they're very, very unfortunate. They're not at the professional level that they really should be at. And um, that's because there was a breakdown in communication there. So we, we've spoken a little bit about, um, you know, how nonprofits and how agencies and freelancers, you know, kind of interact and work um, over the last uh number of years, you know, taking a look at, um, at RFPs that come into us that we look at and, and yes. talk about, um, you know, uh, putting together a response and the amount of time and effort involved. I'm not sure, um, like I've been on both sides. I've worked in nonprofits for about 16 years. I've, uh, I've, I've been on the, let's put the RFP together side of it and the yep. months and time and effort involved in that. Um, and then you put the RFP out and you hope for really great responses. Sometimes you get some really amazing ones. Sometimes you don't. Um, but being on the agency side, looking at them, um, I think they're, it, you know, in terms of putting it together, it's hours and hours of time. Yes. There was one we put, we put together a response for, uh, we, we had probably spent close to 35 or 40 hours, uh, just in meetings and then actually putting the documentation and all of that together. Um, I, I have my opinions about the R what, what is your opinion about the RFP process? I, well, I have, a I wrote a blog post on what I call the broken RFP process. And, um, you know, I should revisit that blog post because I have very strong opinions on it. I don't do RFPs simply because, as you indicated, they're extremely time consuming, extremely exhausting, uh, requiring a great deal of research if you're going to respond to it on any kind of serious professional level. Moreover, from the perspective of the NPO, they are not effective at finding or soliciting or enrolling professional experienced help. Why is that? They're, first of all, they're a very broad cattle call where from the agency or freelancer perspective, intellectually, you know, if you're getting an RFP, how many other people are getting an RFP? Could be 20 others, could be 50 others, who knows? And in most instances, the RF, the NPO sending forth the RFP is looking for the cheapest possible price, not necessarily the experience. Do they know how to vet for the most experienced agency or individual who could assist them? Do they know that? Odds are they don't. And the other problem that I have with the RFPs is that it's a matter of self-diagnosis. You know, 
you would never dream of going to the doctor and telling the doctor, this is what's wrong with me. This is how much you should charge or how much I'm willing to pay. And this is what tools you need to use and how long it should take. You would never go to the doctor and tell them these things. They'd laugh you out of the office. And yet the, exactly. but, and yet the nonprofit organization will send you a one size fits all gemer, generic form they could be sending to a hundred other competitors and they're telling you here are what tools you have to use here's how you should use them in some cases here's how much you should charge because we're not going to pay a penny more here's who you have to work with here's your deadline you know here's what everything that you should be doing and how you should be doing it so they're self-diagnosing their own problems and they're telling you how to solve their own problems and what it should cost and how long it should take. It's utterly ridiculous. No other service provider in the world would tolerate that. The lawyer, the doctor, the plumber, the electrician, the, even the custodian would never let you walk up to them and tell them how long it should take, how much you should charge, how every tool you should use. That's insane. And yet we permit it. And, and the nonprofit organizations think this is effective. And that's why so many NPOs have no SEO, broken e-commerce, easily hackable websites, you know, crazy email addresses. I've seen the juicy tushy one, two, three, a Gmail for a nonprofit organization. I'm not going to donate money to that. I'm not going to communicate with that NPO. Why would I do that? I mean, come on, I, I could go and teach elementary school. It's, it's, they're operating at a less than perspective when you attempt to self-diagnose. If you know how to do everything yourself, why not just do it yourself? Oh, wait a minute. It's because you don't know how to do it yourself. Why not let the expert be the expert and come in and solve the problem and then pay on the basis of the new value you've received? That solves the problem. So what do I do? I gauge for seriousness and commitment. And if they seem serious and committed, as opposed to shopping around for the cheapest possible price, in which case I can just send them to an affiliate page, I invite them to what I call a virtual cup of coffee, or in my case, tea. Let's have a virtual cup of tea, and we screen for fit. I can, give, I can talk about budget all day long. I don't need to talk about budget all day long. I mean, I, budgets are the number one concern. How much? Not what kind of value can you give me? Or these are the problems I'm having. These, this is how long the problems have been going on. This is how many people it's impacting. This is how it's interfacing with our NPO. This is decreasing our, 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 our don donations. It's always on how much, not how much it's costing us. So the first thing we have to do is get rid of that 500 pound gorilla in the room and talk about money, not value, but, but money. Then we can talk about the value. Like I was saying before, with going through these stages of denial and dealing with the emotional concerns before we can tackle the more intellectually based issues, the pain points that are there. So I always talk about investment ranges first. When I invite I them to a virtual cup of tea, let's sit down, be two adults and have a virtual cup of tea. Sorry to interrupt you. No, I <laughs> I was interrupting you. Uh, apologies for that. Um, I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about originally, where, you know, a lot of organizations, especially, you know, the smaller ones, they're running on a handful of staff and a bunch of, hopefully, volunteers helping them out. Yeah. You know, as, as you said, if they have the experience, why not just do it yourself, right? And I think a lot of this comes down to these organizations, for the most part, don't have the experience in the digital realm in terms of like design trends, right. SEO functionality, building, picking, selecting the right, um, the right stack. So the right system to use for their website or group of systems, like should they use constant contact or MailChimp or 
razor's edge or you know whatever the products happen to be or nothing right? at all to, right it could be nothing. having a google spreadsheet right like and just you know keeping track crm wise right. in terms of your donors there's all kinds of different products out there it, right so right and for each putting, all the how, different how could they possibly how could they possibly put together an rfp that outlines what they want if they don't have the expertise to know what it is that's available it would be much more efficient to say my budget is five thousand dollars i'm going to go and look for an extremely experienced professional individual or agency to help me expand my reach into new markets or to enroll new donors that's much, much more realistic than it is to to say this is how you need to do it. This is what tools you need to use. They don't know what tools they need to use or how those tools should be used. That's ridiculous. You know, I could create a nonprofit organization website within about three hours that I guarantee you could rank on the first page of Google within a couple of weeks. I'm not good in word in Photoshop. I don't need Photoshop to do it. I don't need to use Mailchimp. Chimp. I don't need to use Drupal. You know, I've, I have my own stack of tools, like you said, my own suite of tools, my own processes. But they'll tell you on the basis of what they saw a competitor do, or on the basis of someone else's RFP, or maybe a job uh, app position they saw on indeed or something and it may not necessarily be a good fit for them if you have volunteers running everything then you need help and you need to get on a, a monthly maintenance plan because the volunteer isn't going to know how to find hacking attempts and to block them from being keep trying to hack your website on a daily basis the volunteer won't know how to do that the volunteer might know how to put things in alphabetical order for you though and maybe that would be a better use of an unpaid temporary part-time staff member so you know it's really important to work from a deliberate organized perspective and you get out what you put in i mean you know i always you know look at buddha on the you know the wall behind me it's, it has to do with cause and effect you know, which is a major tenet of Buddhism, cause and effect. What you do has consequences. And, you know, a modern, organized, nonprofit organization should function just like a lean business. I say that quite often, is, is nonprofits need to think of themselves as businesses. Um, they do need money to run, to operate, to keep the lights on, to keep doing the work that they do in the communities or, or with the services that they provide. And, you know, they don't necessarily need a million dollars to have a million dollar impact on the world, but they do, they do need some money in some way at some point for something. Right. And being able to, to keep, keep pushing that and, and have donations, being able to have a, a website, a, a brochure site, even it doesn't need to connect to anything, but just have something very professional and engaging so that when you go and approach uh, organizations or government for grants, right, that they go there and it doesn't look like it was something that was put together, you know, um, really when, sloppily. When we talk about what we could do as digital marketing professionals, what we could do for an NPO, the NPO has their organization and business concept and we want them to run their nonprofit to the best of their abilities and to go make those local connections to form those liaisons and partnerships and local government uh, partnerships and get involved in local programs they don't and should not have the time or energy to say i'm going to go and study seo for two hours a night and even at that level you're not going to be an expert in seo for at least a year or so if you did it like that i mean i started studying seo in 96 or 98 or something and i regularly have to get up to speed on its changes so 
you know, you have to kind of come to it with that perspective that I'm going to an expert to get help to make these things come to fruition. Ask a lot of questions, expect them to be informed and to be able to answer your questions, but be open to really growing a business exponentially. You know, it's like there was a um, an optician I worked with maybe five years ago, maybe longer. And um, we had that discussion and I just, what are the problems you're facing? Well, we want to be able to bid on government contracts. Okay, did you know you could automate that process? Let's work that out. Let's hammer out the details of that so you can bid on these contracts. Don't worry about the website because right now the money to, is, to be made is in the government contracts. So here's the discussion. Would you invest $5,000 if you could make back that amount five times over in six months? And then to most businesses and to most NPOs, it's incomprehensible. The, the possibility of that is just, you know, completely unimaginable. You know, I'm thinking of an expletive, but that's how we as professionals, we have to talk to the NPO and explain. If you take one high value time consuming process and automate that, you're going to make back whatever you could invest in me many times over very quickly. So automate the bid process, automate the email process, automate, you know, the blogging process by having someone write one blog post per week or bi-weekly or monthly for you and editing it, one video per week, one podcast per month, you know, whatever. But by having that put together for you, now you're freed up to go and make those phone calls and take those meetings with other NPOs and other government organi organizations because that's where the real money is to be made. And that's work that we can't do and we shouldn't be, be doing for you. In other words, stay in your lane. Well, it, it's really interesting you're talking about, um, you know, having somebody put together blog posts or, you know, work on podcasts. Content repurposing. Exactly. So there, there's content repurposing, content marketing. What's your take on how or if nonprofits should do and participate in content marketing? 100%. The, you know, the only way or reason that a nonprofit organization should not participate in content marketing is if you're a one person shop and you have no interest whatsoever in writing on a regular basis. And really, quite honestly, if that's you, should you even be doing this? Are you even, and I don't want to say this in a mean way, but it may be that you're pre-launch phase so that you may be at the point where you're not quite ready to start the nonprofit, or maybe it shouldn't be a nonprofit. So, but if your goal is to expand reach, to increase donations and grow as an NPO, absolutely you need to be blogging on a consistent basis. If you can't do it consistently, don't start. The same is true with podcasting. You know, I'm on my third podcast now, but it's primarily because I'm one person. I'm semi-retired, knock on wood, thank God. You know, I... I started the podcast because they were fun for me. When they stopped being fun, I stopped doing them. Okay, that's a completely different perspective than what should be a lean, mean, focused NPO machine. So if you have the infrastructure in place where you have someone to help you write the content, produce the podcast, make the videos, in other words, a miniature marketing department, then you should begin doing this. And when I say miniature marketing department, I, you don't need 20 people. You need maybe four or five people, and these can be virtual assistants, or it could be even one or two virtual assistants who work remotely and are really, really good. You know, I have a, a, a content repurposing package. I don't know if it's listed on my website or not, but it's like what you said, one blog post, 
per month, turn it into a video, turn it into a, a, a blog post, a podcast, a video, an infographic summarizing key concepts. Well, if you can do that once per month, imagine the amount of content or marketing collateral we'll have after one year. Now, imagine what would happen if you could do that on a weekly basis. Every Monday morning at 9 a.m., we have a new podcast, a new blog post, a new video, a new infographic. How many, uh, uh, you know, uh, marketing collateral pieces are you going to have? So you have to look at it like that. The more deliberate, the more organized and structured you are with what you do, the more seriously you take it and see problems as solvable, you know, solvable Rubik's Cube, the more you can really get done very methodically. But the savior complex doesn't work. It really didn't even work for Jesus, if you think about it. I mean, you know, there's, there's a part in the Bible where I think he told Judas, you know, get me out of here. I'm not a biblical scholar, but I remember somewhere in the Bible, you know, he asked Judas, there's too many people. I, I can't heal every single person here. So if he couldn't do it and you're not an expert in digital marketing and you don't have all the time and energy in the world, how are you going to grow a business exponentially without help? You know, it, it, so I mean, my heart goes out to NPOs. In many cases, I love their missions. But in order to help them, we both have to be able to come to the table and be very open and honest and transparent with each other. The, the NPO has to be honest about what is a realistic uh, budget estimate or range for them, as well as what they can or cannot do. And then the digital marketing person or agency has to be transparent about the tools and skills that they bring to bear, as well as the important value. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's exactly it, right? You need to figure out what your budget is, what your what you want to achieve, bring in some experts, have them do some discovery sessions and invest maybe a little bit of money to, to bring in the experts to talk about and find out what it is that you actually really need to achieve what your goal is, what your desired outcome is. And then also um, it, it, a website, your digital marketing is not really one and done. You need to have ongoing time and effort put into it. It doesn't have to be expensive. You know, like David was just talking about producing content on a regular basis every Monday morning or once every two weeks or whatever it is, um, you know, in terms of producing the content, it could be what we tell our clients, you know, 300 words, 350 words, right? It doesn't have to be really long, verbose pieces of content. Oh, that's that not produce. long enough at all. Right? No way. That's like okay, three so paragraphs. What would you recommend? I would say at least, at least 500 words. And again, from the perspective of a form, former English teacher, 500 words is five paragraphs. Typically, with the average paragraph being around five to 10 sentences. So just long enough for you to express an idea and give some depth, three or four internal links, and that means linking to other blog posts and other pages, three or four external links, linking to scholarly or competitive, competitive websites that link higher than you. And I'm not saying that to negate what you were saying, just as my own personal feelings on it, you know, but you brought up a great point when we talk about websites being perceived as one and done's single objects. And I hear that many, many times. How much is a website is if you're ordering, you know, a cheeseburger or something, or you're, you know, buying a banana or something. It's not an object. If you look at government websites, even at the dawn of the internet back in the 90s or earlier, I started in the mid 90s, government websites were seen as portals. Portals, they weren't single objects. You would go to the government website so that you could use their e-commerce, so that you could pay bills, you could check, you know, you could check on the status of an order. You could download documentation that you needed. A doctor will have a portal so that you can check on your medical condition or see your medical report. You can pay your bill. You can see has your prescription been shipped yet. Uh, 
You can see when your next appointment is. Any doctor or dentist who doesn't have these tools usually is not seen as being professional. And yet the NPO will think, oh, I can have a one page website and the contact form is very simplistic. It may or may not work. The SEO does is incorrect or doesn't doesn't even exist or I don't know what SEO is and that's OK. And all my competitors rank higher in Google than I do. How is that acceptable? Um, and it really shouldn't be if you're passionate about your NPO success. So when we talk about a website, it's a process through which all of these other factors must go in order for them to deliver the results that you want. So SEO, e-commerce, content marketing, brand identity, so that people will have the same experience, whether they look at you on Facebook or on Twitter or LinkedIn or go to your company website or read a blog post or watch a video. That's branding. If you want to know branding, look at Target, look at Barnes & Noble, look at Amazon, look at these huge global companies. Or if you're a nonprofit, look at Kaiser Permanente, which is extremely profitable, one of the most profitable companies in the United States, and they're an NPO. So you want to look at all of these factors as going through the company website and working hand, hand in hand to basically you know, work to support this NPO. And as far as budgeting, if I may touch on that, it, to touch on budgeting very briefly, a lot of NPOs don't know how to budget, especially those who are new. They don't know what a budget should be. Uh, and again, I love a lot of the nonprofit missions, but you can't have a champagne do uh, a wish or champagne taste in a beer budget. Back when I had my agency and I was advertising very aggressively, uh, where was this? In Denver. So if I wanted to put an ad in a local Denver newspaper, it would cost me several thousand dollars to put an ad in a local newspaper. And it would only run for two or three months. Once I stopped paying, the newspaper would stop running the ad. Whatever phone calls or emails I might get would stop with that. Now, the newspaper would never guarantee you're going to get X number of phone calls per month or X number of phone calls or emails per month. They would never guarantee that. OK, they would just tell you point blank. If you want to advertise in our newspaper, this is our circulation. And you have to pay two, three thousand dollars at the barest minimum to get exposure in their newspaper. And after that two to three month period, the ad stops. Well, if you want to get a decent website, that's still, that's a modest, but decent estimate or range, two to 3,000 to quote unquote, play with the big boys. It's very, it's, it's a modest, but decent amount. I think most agencies or individuals would take you seriously and go, okay, well, at least there's something that, that, that we can work with to put our time and energy into. Now, take it a step further. If you wanted to put an ad in a radio station, that amount of investment would increase exponentially because you still have people listening to terrestrial radio in their car. So you would pay several thousand dollars more per month to have an ad placed on a radio station. The advertisement has to be at a more professional level as well in order to be featured in that way. So now the level of investment goes down much higher. To advertise on Hulu, I think is only 500 a month or something now. So you can advertise on Hulu and YouTube and Amazon and all these other incredible websites millions and billions of people use around the world every day for around that same amount. So it's fine to have these goals, but like a Thoreau said, build your castle in the air for that is where they should be, not lay your foundation beneath it. So that's how I like to explain budgeting. If we compare it to the newspaper, radio, and television, you know, Trinity, you have to start at several thousand. And as you want to increase exposure, 
that's how you should budget. That's how you should put the ranges. And it's very, very similar. So hopefully that helps for anybody uh, who is interested in truly, truly growing a business. Absolutely. Um, I, th I think it's really important for nonprofits to take their website seriously. It's, um, it's, it's unfortunate. We, we conducted an audit of over 300 nonprofits and charity websites, and there's so many of them that are just, they look like they were made around the dawn of the internet, probably, uh, you know, and, and what is that going to do to your donors, right? Is it going to turn them off? Are they yeah. going to think about investing in your organization when it looks like your website was made maybe 15, 20 years ago, right? right. Making sure that you have something that, that can speak to your mission and showcases the, the amazing work that you're doing, I think is absolutely critical. Producing this content over time, like you were just talking about, to drive more traffic into your website, to talk about the work that you're doing, and to try to build up your public profile and getting found in search. I, I think those are all like really key pieces. Yeah, my wife likes to donate to several nonprofit organizations and she'll find new ones every once in a while that she wants to donate. But as a savvy internet user, she will go to a nonprofit website. And if it looks like a PowerPoint presentation, she won't take it seriously. If it doesn't have the green lock to show that it's secure, she knows not to use it. If they won't take PayPal, she won't use it because she knows that if there's an issue, I have no support. Or if they take the money and run or tap my bank account or something, I have no recourse. So it's really incumbent upon the nonprofit organization to take what they do seriously. And, you know, rather than to send out the mass cattle call RFP, engage in open dialogue, being clear about your pain points and asking questions about the experience. And, you know, seeing the website is more than an item but is a portal through which all these different digital marketing assets can go so that you can begin receiving the value that you need, the functions that you need help with. And in order to do that, they have to be aware of what they need. So they need to be kind of guided almost and taken through this process so that they're informed. So. You know, that's why I put so much emphasis on screening first and then onboarding. And if we reverse it, the nonprofit should expect whoever they talk to to screen them for fit and then have an onboarding process where they're trained in how this person works, um, but also in making sure that they're familiar with these concepts of SEO and e-commerce and content marketing, content repurposing, like we discussed. And, you know, what is PPC? What is a paid advertising budget? that I should set aside if I want to get results. You know, so whoever they talk to should be able uh, and happy to articulate that. Sorry to go off on a tangent. No, you're at, you're absolutely spot on. If anybody that's listening to this is thinking of redoing their website and you're going out there and you're like, okay, um, I understand that there's a purpose and intent behind having an open uh, process, um, especially for any organizations that are gov getting government funding. Um, see if there's a way before you engage in the RFP process to connect with some agencies and have these conversations that David was just talking about. May, uh, you know, if they can't tell you, um, you know, how much you should be spending in your ad spend, um, that might be a bit of a red flag. If they don't know about the Google grants for nonprofits, for registered charities, that would be a red flag if they can't talk about the benefit of having content produced or published on your website on a regular basis, uh, you know, m multiple red flags there. Um, I would even take it a step absolutely. further and say that a website by itself is nothing. It's like, a, it's like clothes. I mean, without someone to wear the clothes and give them some personality, it's an empty vessel, right? So having a website with no content, with no SEO or incorrect SEO, it does no one any good. You know, I remember a long time ago, I volunteered to help a, a 
I think it was two nonprofit organizations. And uh, my heart really went out to the, the causes that they were putting forth. And so one nonprofit organization was one to help homeless veterans. And I thought, well, that's a fabulous cause. I contacted the NPO, you know, for, for Claire, I would be happy to help you. What do you need done? What are your pain points? What are you trying to get done? Do you have competitors who are eating your lunch that you want to, you know, be like them or whatever? I created the site. Within two weeks, it went to number one in Google for their type of nonprofit where they were for their geographic location. The person in charge of the NPO sent me an email about a week later, said, I need you to delete the website, take it down completely. I said, why would you want that? You're, you must, I know you're getting phone calls because I see the emails being sent. Because, right, I BCC myself so I can track the emails and I can see that they're working. So I know. She said, well, we're getting so many phone calls and emails, we don't know what to do. And we're getting donations, but we're not set up as a three, uh, what is it, 301C? Uh, 501. 501C3. 501C3, thank you. Uh, which shows how long it's been. And... She said, well, we're not set up as a 501c3 organization. I said, well, you told me you were. Okay, so basically we don't have the infrastructure to handle the phone calls and the emails or actually help the people or t handle the donations. So I said, that's fine. Give me 24 hours. I'll take care of everything. Have a, have a great rest of your life. I'm sorry things didn't work out. I took a lot of screenshots. I made a video of the website so I could save it for my own records of the work that I had done. And obviously that changed a lot for me. So now I would never dream of working with a nonprofit unless first we screened for fit, then onboarded to make sure that they had the assets available that were necessary, that they were familiar with all of these concepts and, uh, and processes. So, when you go through that as an NPO, I'm sure it was very painful on her part. And from my perspective, it's painful because here I have this stunning website that's getting you phone calls and donations, but now we have to delete it all within the span of one month. That's not where you want to be. So you need that foundation first. Absolutely. 100%, right? If you're, if you want to um, go out there and, you know, sell shoes online, you need the infrastructure for fulfillment, you need the infrastructure for payments, and you need the infrastructure to handle customer complaints and refunds and returns and all of that. It's not just, okay, we're going to go and, and do this. We're not just going to accept these donations. You yeah. know, how, what do you do? internally from a fundraising side, from a donations uh, perspective side for donors that want to leave pieces in their estates or their wills or to, to your organization. Exactly. It's really important. Yeah. So and completely set up on the back end to handle that. Exactly. And if, and if, again, we compare this to other service providers, if you go to a doctor, they have an on, a screening and onboarding process. It's very stringent. In the U.S., I don't know how it is in Canada, but in the U.S., everything is based on your either your income level or the type of insurance you have. So if I call a doctor in the U.S., the first thing they're going to ask me is, what insurance do you have? We can't forget about making an appointment and diagnosing your problem. And you're not going to call a doctor and say, how much is a visit to the doctor? And I need this done immediately. And if you're not cheap enough, I'm going to go to another doctor. It doesn't work like that unless you do, you know, you find a doctor who works in his garage or something, which they do have in the U.S., but I wouldn't go to one. So, I mean, you, you've got to have these what they call boundaries, rules and limitations. So these very important strictures in place. So, yeah, if you go to any other service provider, they're going to have a way to first make sure that you're fit for them, that you've got what they need in order for them to work with you. Then they tell you what the payment is going to be. And in many cases, they don't even tell you what the payment is going to be. You just get the bill. So we have to kind of look at it like that, you know, that I'm going to this expert 
on the basis of their experience in order to resolve a serious issue to me. And if the issue isn't serious, then it's a hobby. Absolutely. So this has been so great. We've had, it's really fun to talk to another person that's been doing the agency work, but that's been, that's been working, uh, you know, in, in my shoes and having these kind of conversations and helping um, the people that are listening to this episode really kind of understand a little bit more holistically kind of a, a 360 degree approach um, to all the different facets and all the different bits of, of um, content, backend editing, things that they, they should really know about um, as they go into potentially a website redesign or thinking about looking at an RFP process and, and the, uh, the pain that can be associated with that. Um, so thank you so much. I think this has uh, been a really great episode. I hope the people listening have been able to get some great advice uh, from you and some pointers today. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, um, what do they need to do? Well, I'd like to just add one little point at the end, if I may. I think sure. everybody in the digital marketing space, I'm sure you would agree with this, we resonate with the purposes and causes of nonprofit organizations. In most cases, we want to be able to help you, but we need the nonprofit organization to meet us in partnership and to have dialogue about needs and uh, what the most important and pressing issues are where we can contribute and add value to you as opposed to buying objects, which is a common perception that we all and we both see on a, on a regular basis, I think it's fair to say. So I think that's really important to bear in mind that, you know, we want to be able to help you, but we need you to meet us halfway when I talk about these concerns that we've discussed in our interview. Uh, as far as, you know, how people can reach out to me to learn more, to get a lot of free uh, giveaways I have on my website. I have free downloads and reports and checklists and even an uh, ideal client game that you can take to see if you're a good fit for digital marketing on my website. I also offer free no hassle consultation that you can go to my website and schedule one and I'll talk to you and be brutally honest with you just like I was here. So all you have to do is go to Google and type in dms.blue or go into any browser and just type in dms.blue and hit enter. Fantastic. So I know you've mentioned a couple of uh, blog articles in today's episode and the link to your website. We're going to have a show notes page. Just anybody listening, head over to wowdigital.com slash podcast. Find this episode with David Summerfleck and we'll have the links in the show notes for you. Um, I hope that everybody takes something from this, at least one maybe actionable item that you've heard and you go back and you talk to the people in your team, or if it's just you, uh, you know, go back and, and do something with it and have an awesome day. Keep on being successful and we'll see you on the next episode.